it up. That's not no, thank you. I'm technically challenged. <laughs> my kids start telling me, well, Dad, you need to do this, you need to do this. I said, look, I know how to get my email. <laughs> I can write sermons on the computer. I can write a few books on the computer. I'm okay. Uh, it's, it's, again, it's good to be with you. I appreciate uh, Pastor Sam and Scylla, and I appreciate the house, and I appreciate all you guys that are from different places uh, being here this morning is a great honor for me to be here in the Manchester area and uh, just to have an honor of speaking the word of the Lord into that which represents the kingdom in this region. So uh, thank you for having me. I, I have, uh, so for those that may not know, I, have, I pastored for 22 years and eight years ago the Lord spoke to my wife and I to hand the church that we had planted, a very successful church, an apostolic center. Uh, we had TV ministry and Ministry of the Poor and schools and Bible schools and, I mean, you name it, we had it operating uh, on a pretty high level and the Lord said for us to hand that off and they began to launch out into more of a kingdom ministry and um, actually I had, a, I had a dream before he said that to me that uh, I was being separated from everything. That, that I literally, I won't go into the dream, but I literally said to the Lord in this dream, what must I do to love you more? And he spoke one word, separation. Little did I know, I look back now and realize what he meant, but little did I, I didn't know what he meant then. And, uh, and so over the course of time, we were separated from everything that we had built and that we and the, and the relationships that we had because God had another kingdom assignment for us. How I many you know all of us have kingdom assignments? They vary from person to person, and we can't compare ours to somebody else. But our job is to fulfill the kingdom assignment we have been given. Uh, as you, I'm going to even share just a little bit in regards to that today, that, that we will be evaluated, we will be judged on the basis of how well we fulfill the assignments that God gave us uh, in the earth. And we're going to still talk about the courts of heaven this morning. So look with me in Daniel chapter 7 and verses 9 and 10. And would, could someone bring me the board? Um, I know that someone got the board. And if we could just set it up here, I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm definitely not a school teacher, so my handwriting will not look like a teacher's handwriting on the chalkboard. Uh, and I'm, I'm definitely, definitely, definitely not an artist, so don't expect anything great. But what I want to put on this board will help us understand some of the things that I want to teach this morning. So Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, Daniel says again, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheel of burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. So everything that he's describing, he's now calling the court. The court was seated, and the books were open. Or, or we could say the scrolls. That's another word for the books. Uh, the scrolls or the books were open. And so, um, uh, and, and again, what we're seeing here is, is we're seeing this that is recorded in other places of Scripture where that there's a spiritual dimension where the throne of God is and multiple thrones are around that throne and then there's thousands of thousands worshiping and there's four living creatures crying out, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. And it's a spiritual dimension that makes up what the Bible calls the court of the Lord. Now, what you have to understand is that, as I shared yesterday, we have a position in that court because we have now come to Zion. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We, therefore, have a function in the court of heaven. This, this glorious, wonderful court that actually has the power to change life on the planet and verdicts come out of that court, we have a position and we have a function in that court. And in fact, we have the power, if you can hear this, to set that court in motion. And, and, and I'll show some of that to you this morning. But here's what I want to zero in on today. The Bible says the court was seated and the books, everybody say books. The books were open. 
Okay, so watch this. Whatever these books are, the court and the books, their activity go together. Because the court was seated and the books were open. Here's, I'm going to give you the, the, the gist of it right here. Simply put, it's this. It takes courtroom activity to get what's in the books functioning in the earth. It take, that's why the court was seated or came to order, came into session, and as soon as it came to session, the books were open because what the court is about to do is going to allow what's in the books to become reality in the earth. Now, some of you, perhaps many of you, are saying, well, what's the deal with the books? Well, you need to understand heaven is filled with books. If we could see into heaven and into the spirit realm, you would see probably, if you will, libraries of books, libraries of scrolls. For instance, Psalms 139 in verse 16, David said, in, he, he said, all my substance yet unformed and my days yet unfashioned were written down in your book. In other words, David is saying, before I ever existed in the earth, my days, my form, my fashion, the, 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 my, my reason for existence was written down in a book in heaven. That's important. Amen. That means that every one of us in this room has a book in heaven. That before we came into being in the earth, our destiny, our purpose, what we were to accomplish, literally details of the days that we would live out, our form, our substance, I believe it implies what we would actually look like. The scripture says before we entered the earth, all of that was written down in heaven. And we are here to live out in earth what was written down in our books in heaven. Now that is, Bib that is Bible. And, and the Apostle Paul backs this up. For instance, in 2 Timothy 1.9, it says, he says to Timothy, The one who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. All right, something happened before time began. And you're going to see how this all fits together as I move through this. Something happened before time began because books were written before time began. Before there was ever a, a, a thing called time, in the eons ago, in the eternities of God, God wrote a book about each one of us. And the Bible says that when he wrote that book and it was decided what we would do, what we would be, what our purpose would be, what our reason would be for existing in planet earth, the Bible says at that point he apportioned to us purpose and grace. Purpose and grace. It, was given, it says purpose and grace was given to us before time began. So here's the deal. When we come into the earth, when, we, when you came into the earth, when I was born into the earth, when you were born into the earth, you need to understand that you began the discovery process of purpose and grace that God had already given you. Again, I said this last night. We keep trying to get God to give us stuff he's already given us. We, get God, we keep trying to get God to do things he's already done for us. The scripture says your purpose, why you exist, has already been given to you before you ever existed in the earth, literally before time began. And it is said not only was your purpose a portion to you, but grace was a portion to you. So purpose is the reason you are here. Grace is the power to do it. So here's how you'll know you've discovered your purpose. There's grace attached to it. See, if there's not grace attached to what you're doing, then you haven't yet discovered your purpose. You'll know you've found your purpose because there's grace attached to it. Let me tell you what, what would characterize grace. Number one, you'll know that you've found, you, well, you'll know you've found your purpose because grace attached to it. Because, number one, you like what you do. If you're doing, listen, you like what you do. God has not sentenced you to live a life of misery and constant endurance. It's like Pastor Sam just said a while ago. 
We're not always in war. We're not always in battle. We ought to be enjoying life. It ought to be fun. Life ought to be enjoyable. Okay, so if you're not enjoying life, you've yet to discover your purpose. Because you have that, I know that because you haven't discovered grace yet. Because when you have discovered it, you actually enjoy life. You enjoy what you do. A second thing is, you're good at what you do. You're good at what you do. In other words, there's results from what you do. If you're doing what you're graced to do, it actually produces something. Because God put us on the planet to be fruitful. In fact, he said to, about the tree, if that tree doesn't bear fruit this year, cut it down. Why does it keep using up the ground but producing no fruit? Because, see, grace will produce fruit. That's what Paul said in Titus. The grace has come into the world that literally is producing fr fruit all over the world. Because whenever I find my purpose with grace attached to it, I am going to not only enjoy what I do, I'm going to be producing fruit from what I do. A third thing, others will bear witness to what you do. Now, I didn't say everybody would, but significant others will. They will be in agreement that this is what you're supposed to doing, be doing because they bear witness to that. And then number four, the fourth thing is, when you really find your purpose that has grace attached to it, this may blow you out of the water, God will allow you to make a living doing it. Money will be connected to that. There will be livelihood that will come out of that. God didn't sentence you to hate getting up every morning to go to work. Sorry, you need to find something else to do or have a change of heart, one of the two. Because God didn't sentence you to do that. He wants you to make a living doing something you're graced to do. So that you actually make money doing what you enjoy to do, doing what you're good at, doing what other people uh, bear witness to you doing and literally you have discovered the purpose and the grace that was apportioned to you that was given to you before time began because God wrote it down in a book in heaven about you amen now I'm not saying there's not seasons of time where you have to do some things you don't like doing see I was all I knew I knew I was called to the ministry I knew that but I didn't get to start off being in the ministry. I had to learn how to do maintenance work in a hospital. Then I had to do maintenance work in a, in a uh, meat packing plant. Then I had to do maintenance work in a well shop. And then I had, to do I had to do all that stuff. But I hated every moment of it. I hated every moment of it. Not because I was lazy, because I'm not lazy. I'm a very hard worker. There's one thing I can't stand, and that's laziness. I can't stand that. Don't get in my way. I can't stand that. My, ask my kids. They'll know. Dad can't stand laziness. But it wasn't what I was built for. But it was things that God was using to prepare me for what I was built for. So I'm not, I'm, I don't need you to understand. You don't always start off doing what you're actually graced to do. But God will use those other things to get you ready to step into the purpose that you are graced for, that was actually created for you before time began. So, so I'm, I just I'm, I want our minds to begin to think this. That's why I'm talking about this. So, the Bible says in Psalms 139:16 that there was a book that was written about you before time began. It's in heaven. And listen, you ought to live your life with a sense of destiny about that. Uh, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 10 that there's a book for nations. There's a book for nations. The scripture says that John the apostle took the little book from the hand of the angel. He ate, ate the book. And the scripture says then he began to prophesy what, what was in that book. And he began to prophesy about many tongues and kings and people and tribes. He began to prophesy about nations because he had, he had eaten a book that empowered him to prophesy about nations. So that book was about nations. You need to know every nation has a book in heaven about it. Every city has a book in heaven about it. Let me just bring it on down. Every church has a book in heaven about it. Everything that is a kingdom business has a book in heaven about it. You see, if it has a kingdom purpose, there's a book in heaven about it. 
And this is what I tell people. If there's not a book in heaven about it, don't waste your time on it. If there's not a book in heaven about it, don't waste your time on it. Because you're going to be wasting time on something that doesn't matter to God. Because God wrote books about everything that matters to him. And in its kingdom purpose for, for e, from eons ago for generations to come. And our, our privilege is to discover what's in that book. Now, to help these books. So, so there's books about everything in the earth that has kingdom purpose. Okay. Let me tell you, let me ex explain this to you. Even Jesus has a book about himself. Let me show you how important this is. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. Jesus said, prophesying about himself before he came into the world. He prophesied through David in Psalms 40. The writer of Hebrews picked it up, Hebrews 10, 5 through 7, and used it as a prophecy that Jesus prophesied about himself, that, that he, of what he would do when he would come to the earth. And this is what he said. It said, a, a, a burnt offering and sacrifice you did not want, but a body, Jesus said, you have prepared for me. So Jesus was given a body through the virgin birth. A body you have prepared for me. I have come, O God, watch this, I have come, O God, it is written of me in the volume of the book to do your will. So what did Jesus come to the earth for? He came to the earth to inhabit a fleshly body through which he could fulfill in that fleshly body what had been written about him in heaven. Because he had a book in heaven that he had to come into the earth to fulfill. That's why John 1, 14 says he is the word made flesh. That means a lot of different things. But one of the things it means is that there is a word in heaven about him that Jesus came into the earth to flesh out. And God gave him a body to do it in. Because everything that comes out of heaven must be born into the earth. And there was a body that Jesus was born into that allowed him over the course of his life, 30 plus years, over the course of his life to be able to fulfill and complete everything that had been written in the book of heaven about him. Every one of us has a book. Every church has a book. Every business that's called of God has a book. Every nation has a book. Every city has a book. There's a book about everything that has kingdom purpose. Now watch this. So when it says the court was seated and the books were open, what's it saying? It's saying this. That if we're to get what's in the books fleshed out into the earth, we're going to have to have courtroom activity to do it through. Because the books cannot come into being without courtroom activity. That's why the court was seated and came to order. And the books were open because the court was about to operate in function that was going to give the legal right for what was in the books in heaven to become fleshed out in the earth. Now, to help us really nail this down before I go into some other things, look with me in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Look at your neighbor and say, you have a book in heaven. Say, I have a book in heaven. Luke chapter 22. Notice what, what, what Jesus says. We, we know the scripture, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. Notice what he says. Sates, uh, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked. The King James Version says has desired. So the word desired or asked in the Strong's Concordance. If you look it up in the Strong's Concordance. You don't have to try to, you don't have to search the root out. You don't have to try to twist it to mean this. You don't need to say, oh, this is what that Greek word means way over here. No, you don't have to do that. All you got to do is look up the word desired. And here's what it means. He demanded you be put on trial. 
That's exactly what that word means. Satan has demanded you to be put on trial. What's going on here? Satan, see, see, this is what I believe. Satan doesn't know everything. But whenever God opens a book, if you can hear this, when God opens a book for us to see, it's interesting that the court was seated and the books were open. Because you need to understand that it's not every book is open. In the book of Revelation, there was a book sealed with seven seals that was not open. In Revelation 5, what happens? John the Apostle that's now in the court system of heaven. He's been caught up into the courts of heaven around the throne of God where all of this happens. He begins to weep profusely. An angel comes and says, don't weep, John. For the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book. And John, the Bible says, turns to see this lion. And instead he sees a lamb in the midst of the throne that had been slain. Because the governmental roar of the lion always comes out of the brokenness of the lamb. Any people that tries to roar before they have come through the realms of brokenness... It's tingling brass and sounding cymbal. There's no real authority in it because the authority of the lion is found in the brokenness of the lamb. We need, to, we, we need to understand that or we'll keep trying to do things we haven't gone through the necessary process to be prepared to do. So the scripture says that John saw this and he says, don't weep. Because one has prevailed to open the book. So here's the deal. Why was John weeping for a book to be open? Because he understood that the book of Revelation is about courtroom activity. The whole book is about courtroom activity granting God the legal right to reclaim his planet for himself. Everything about the book of Revelation comes out of that throne, comes out of that court system. Judgments are coming out. All sorts of things are coming out of that court system. Why is John weeping? Because he realizes there cannot be a climax and there cannot be an end and there cannot be verdict, verdicts rendered that will allow God to reclaim the planet back to himself until that book gets open. There are books in heaven that are still shut. Can I give you a secret to opening a book? You ready? The secret to opening the book is tears. When John wept, when John wept, something shifted in the heavens for the lion of the tribe of Judah who had been found worthy to open that book. Our tears open books. If you have ever been in intercession, if you have ever been in a place of groaning and weeping and moaning, and you don't even know why, probably books are being opened. Because there can be no courtroom activity until books are open. Everything is at a stalemate. The satanic is still ruling because books have not been opened. We need books open. So the scripture says that the books were open. Here's the deal. When the books are open, that means now revelation is accessible. Now we can start seeing into these books. But here's what I believe. I don't know that I can prove this. I'm just going to tell you what I believe. You take it for what it's worth or not worth. But not only can we see into the books, but I believe it gives the satanic opportunity to see into the books. I don't think that satanic can see into the books until they're open. So here's what I'm saying that to say this. When, when Jesus comes to Peter and says, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded you be put on trial. It's because... Somehow or another, Satan has seen into Peter's book. And he knows if I don't stop this guy, what is in his book, if he fleshes out and gets what is in his book, here's what's going to happen. He is going to do massive damage to my satanic empire, and he is going to be a vehicle through which God begins to establish awesome kingdom rule. So I have to take him to trial, I have to accuse him, I have to build a case against him, and I have to get him disqualified so that God as judge cannot legally give him what's in his book. 
Guys, this goes on every day in the court system of heaven concerning us. The truth was, Peter got what was in his book. We still talk about him today because he fleshed out what was written in his book. But Satan tried to stop him through legal wranglings and wrestlings in the courts of heaven. He demanded, he said to God, I demand he be put on trial. I have a case against him. If you can picture it this way, it's like we call it a grand jury in the States. Meets to see if there's enough evidence to file charges against someone. Satan is saying, I have searched Peter's life. I have searched his bloodline. I have searched everything concerning him. See, remember what he said about Jesus. Jesus said, he has come to me but found nothing in me. That's not true for you and me. He came to Peter and he found all sorts of stuff. And he said, I have got all sorts of evidence that I need to present before the court of heaven that will disqualify and stop you from granting what's in Peter's book to Peter. I demand a trial date for Peter. And he went on trial. Jesus stood in his behalf. You need to know this. Jesus stood in his behalf not as the son of God and as the high priest because he had not won that position yet. He stood for Peter as a mortal man because Jesus never did anything as God when he walked the earth. If he did, he forfeited his right to be our Savior because man lost creation. Only a man could win it back. So when Peter, when Jesus says, I prayed for you, Peter, he didn't mean I prayed for you as God. I didn't take my special position as God. I went in there as a mortal man, and I did business in the court of heaven, and I got a verdict in your behalf, and you're going to go through a pl tough place, but you're going to come out on the other side because heaven has said you're qualified to get what in your book how many of you want what's in your book I want what's in mine you need to know see this is the problem we haven't understood we haven't understood why we feel frustrated sometimes why we think wait I was made for more than this why 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 I just intuitively know I was made for more than this I'm not even talking about the prophecies and all of these things. I just know I was made for something more. Why have I not been able to experience and step in to the something more? It's because we haven't answered the questions in the courts of heaven that allow God the legal right to grant us what's in our book. Are you following me? So let me talk to you for just a little bit about this book thing because there's several things that, that that Peter that Jesus did for Peter that allowed him to get what was in the book but I want to promise you if you have not fully stepped into what's in your book it's because something legal is resisting it and we need to know how to answer those questions in the court system of heaven of heaven just as Jesus answered it for Peter Here's what I want to do. I want to talk to you about this. I want to try to explain this a little, little further, a little deeper, so we can get an appreciation for what's going on. Okay? First of all, we need to understand something that, I, that is called the counsel of the Lord. Counsel, that's not how you spell it. Counsel, counsel. That's terrible. Okay. Is that, is that going to erase? Because I didn't do anything. Let me try another. I don't want to mess your board up. Permanent marker, marker pen. Come here, somebody. Let me write on you. See if we can get it off of you. Right now. <laughs> I'm just joking. Is this okay? Or I mean, is it okay? Okay. And so, uh, so there's something called a council. It's the Hebrew word sod, S-O-D. And in Jeremiah 23:18, it says, "Who has stood in the council of the Lord?" And so the idea is that who, who stood in that dimension of God when there was a council? The word council means uh, a, a, secret, a, a secret advisory a position, uh, you know, those kind of things. Um, it, it, it's, um, it's speaking of that which is advisory in its nature. It's, see, it's speaking of people coming together to make a decision, all these kind of things. It's what you would think a council would be. See, there were councils. There are still councils today. I'll show you one in just a moment. But there are councils in the Godhead that made decisions before time began. 
Let me give you, for example, a one. Genesis 1, 26. It says, and, it says, and God said, let us. Everybody say us. Let us, in other words, they were taking counsel together. Let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. Okay? So what was going on there? This was before time began. This was actually before God created the earth. God created the earth so that he could put man that he was going to make into the earth. But he made a decision that man was going to be made out of the Godhead and maybe even out of other, other entities involved in this council. Because I'm going to show you one here in just a moment. Where that there was a council in heaven that took place where decisions were made. So this is what you need to know. The council is for the purpose of making decisions. There are decisions that come out of the counsel of the Lord. The counsel of the Lord. Yeah, that one, okay. It, the, the decisions come out of the counsel. Look at me in 1 Kings 22, because this is going to mess with our theology. 1 Kings, 1 Kings 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. Ahab is wanting to go to battle. And Jehoshaphat, a good king, is with Ahab, an evil king. And Ahab's got all of his prophets in his, in his court prophesying, yes, go, you'll be victorious, you're mighty, you're powerful, you're going to win. And Jehoshaphat's listening to all this, and he says, you know, there's something that doesn't ring true about this. There's something not right here. And he says to Ahab, is there not another prophet that we can consult? And Ahab said, yeah, there's one more named Micaiah, but he never prophesies good about me. And Jehoshaphat and Ahab decide, okay, we're not going anywhere until this Micaiah comes and tells us what he's hearing and what he's sensing. So they go to get Micaiah. And they say to Micaiah, come on, guy, as, as they're bringing him in, be like all the other prophets, just be a team player, and just say what they're all saying. And Micaiah says, I'm only going to speak what the Lord is telling me to speak. So look in verse 19 of 1 Kings 22. And then Micaiah said, after he came before Ahab, therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. So before he comes... He sees what's going on in the spirit realm as these other quote-unquote prophets are prophesying. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner and another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said to him, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Now this has got to mess with our theology. Because this is not what we think the activity of heaven looks like. Here is God of the universe receiving counsel from the host of heaven from other beings that he has created, and all of a sudden he's saying, somebody tell me what's a good idea of bringing Ahab down. And God himself is receiving counsel in this setting, and a spirit comes out and says, I'll go deceive him and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets so that his prophets will prophesy falsely under a false anointing and they will believe it's you and they will go out and they have will fall in battle. And God said, go and do so. Now see, we don't like that because that doesn't fit into our nice theological religious box. But this is going on in heaven. This was God in a sod or a council. And out of that council, a decision was made that God said, that's what we're going to do. And release the Spirit to go do that. You need to understand there are councils in heaven that make decisions. Okay, here's that's where everything starts. There was a council in heaven before time began that made decisions about each one of our lives. The next stage, watch this, was once the decisions were made in the council, they were written down in a book. In a book. From the council, books are created. 
This is where the books came from. The books came out of the decisions made in the council. Now, why is this important? Romans 8, 29 through 30. The Bible says, who he foreknew, he predestined. Important stuff here. In whom he predestined, let me just go ahead and write this down, he called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. These are the five stages to getting what's in our books that came out of the council operating in the earth. Romans 8, 29 through 30. See, the counsel of the Lord was God for knowing and deciding things. Things were, were foreknown in the council. You and I were foreknown in the counsel of the Lord before time began. This church was foreknown in the counsel of the Lord before time began. Your business, if you have one, if it's a kingdom business, was foreknown in the council of the Lord before time began. The, the, the city of Manchester was, as was the nation of England, and so forth and so on. You see, God made plans for everything. God did not get up this morning and decide what he was going to do. This was all decided before time began. And that became, because he made these decisions in his counsel, it became foreknowledge. He foreknew things. Decisions were made. But then he wrote what was decided in the council down in a book, which made it now predestined. People get all bent out of shape about predestination. Lord, help us. Predestination just simply means a thought-out plan beforehand. That's all it means is that God thought out a plan beforehand about you and that it is up to you to discover that plan and line up with it as best you can. And he wrote it down in a book that we are to flesh out in the earth. That's all it means. But the predestined plan came out of the foreknowledge of God that was from the council where decisions were made and then it was written in a book which made it predestined. When books were created, it became a predestined thing that God had ordained. Let me just say this. You and I will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, not on this little sin and that little sin. We will be judged on how much of my life did I fulfill what was written in my book. That's the evaluation and the judgment I will come under. Did I surrender my soul, my heart, my life? Did I yield myself to the plan of the master, to what was written in my books and the predestined plan of God? Did I surrender and say yes to that and give myself to that? Or did I choose my own way and decide I wanted to do something else rather than this? You see, I know what, everybody knows what this feels. I know what this feels like. I knew since I was a little boy and especially since I was about 12 that I was called to ministry. Well, about 16 years old, I met my wife. And I didn't want to be called to ministry anymore. She wasn't my wife then. She was my girlfriend. But I wanted her to be my wife. Two years later, she was my wife, right straight out of high school. Well, we married 37 years this year. But but the bottom line was whenever I met her, we didn't, I, I didn't do anything, you know, bad or anything. I just I just lost interest in what I knew I was supposed to be doing. Because I was much more interested in getting married than I was in being in the ministry. Somebody says, why do you want to get married at 18 years old? Because I wanted to have sex and not go to hell. That was true. And I'm making a point. The reason I say those kind of things is for the sake of young people and sometimes older people. God said fornicators he will judge. I ain't messing with that. 
That can, those scriptures scare me. Yeah, it gets real quiet because it should. Because this that's the word of the Lord. And the Bible says it's better to marry than it is to burn with lust. This is just the word of God, guys. So that's why I got married. Because I was much more interested in being married than I was in being in ministry. But, you know, when it's written in your book and it's predestined, you don't step away from God that easily. Because guess what happened? I'm in my car going to the grocery store to get some bread and milk for my wife Mary that I am now married about two years into our marriage. And God, without invitation, decides to come into my car. Oh, you've got to invite him. He's such a gentleman. No, he is not. I did not invite him. I was not interested, and I heard him say these words just as clear, almost audibly, the time is drawing nigh for you to do my work. And I said, why now, Lord? Because what I meant was, I've got a wife, I've got a car, I've got a house, I've got all the things I have to take care of, I've got a baby on the way, why now, Lord? And instantly, when I said, why now? Instantly, even stronger than the other one, he said, because now you have to trust me. In other words, I got you right where I want you. I won't go into the whole story, but the bottom line is God started executing on me what was written in my book, The Predestined Will. And the very thing I didn't want to do, God, in a matter of weeks, had so shifted my heart to work in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure that I then wanted the very thing that was in my book. See, that's, that's the wonderful thing. Even when we don't want it, God changes our heart because that's the place where we've been purposed and graced to function and to walk. For any of us. Now, not everybody's called to ministry. Believe me, there are some in ministry that have no business being in ministry. Lord, help us. Go do something in the marketplace. I hate to watch people waste their lives on what's not in their books. I hate to see that. I don't want to do that. I want to give my life to what's written in my book. And whatever cost is connected to that, I want to pay it. So that I can have what's in my book. Because it came out of the counsel of God. Decisions were made. It was written down in a book. That was the foreknowledge. It became predestined. Okay, now watch this. Then the Bible says, whom he predestined, he called. What is this? This is where we begin to get glimpses of what's in our book. Glimpses. Because nobody sees all at once everything that's in your book. You start getting glimpses of what's in your book. For instance, 30 years ago, or 25 years ago, I had this desire, this, this illogical desire to teach and to speak at Christ for the Nations, which was about 100 miles from where I lived, to teach and to speak at Christ for the Nations, Garden Lindsay School, they started, and I knew that they had an 11 o'clock session. I never went to the Christ for Nations, had never even been on the campus, but I had this desire. Well, this last year, I'm going to cut the whole story short. This last year, Dutch Sheets, whenever he became the executive director, now he's resigned, but when he became the executive director, he, at, he called me, he said, I need for you to come speak at this 11 o'clock session, and then I also need for you, if you will, to teach a class, one class per day, or a day on Tuesday and Thursday. And literally, a glimpse I had into my book 25 years ago became a reality. Because I had this illogical desire to teach. Here was the deal. 25 years ago, I didn't have a thing to say to anybody at Christ for the Nations. I thought I did, but I didn't. But God worked in my life, and 25 years later... I'm now invited to be an instructor, an adjunct professor at Christ for the Nations. I've never forgotten that. 30 years ago, I had prophecies that said I was called to be a voice to nations. So I, when I was leading the work in Waco, I would take missions trips thinking this was fulfilling that. 
Now I'm traveling full time and I'm going to be in 17 different nations this year. Which blows my mind. In addition to everything I do in the U.S. How many of you know those things were glimpses into my book? You have said the same thing. I mean, those are just a couple of them. I got glimpses that literally decades later are being fulfilled. Now, I'm not saying it has to take decades. I'm just trying to get you to understand this whole issue of glimpses into your book. Now, let me, i got to do this. We're going to run out of time, but let me do this. I'm almost done with the session. Psalms 40. Remember, remember in Hebrews 5 where it says that burnt offering and sacrifice you didn't, but a body you have prepared for me? Remember that? And, it was, and Jesus prophesying to himself. That scripture in Hebrews 10 is taken from Psalms 40, verses 6 through 8. And I want to read it from the original here, where it was originally spoken. It says, Sacrifice and offering, in verse 6 of Psalms 40, you did not desire. My ears, Jesus said, prophetically through David, you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God, and your law is within my heart. Everybody wants to know what's in their book. Rightfully so. We should want to know what's in our book from the counsel of the Lord. We need to know. Those books are open. We need to know. Okay, so everybody wants to know. Let me give you a clue here. It says, God's, uh, Jesus said, in the scroll of the book it's written to me. And then he says, and your law is within my heart. So here's the, here's the whole deal. Cutting through the chase. Whatever God wrote in the book in heaven, he also wrote in your heart. So if you want to find out what's in your book in heaven, look inside your heart. What's your interests? What's your passions? What's your desires? What's your longings? What is it that's in your heart? Because if you'll look inside your heart, you will discover that whatever is written in your book in heaven, he also is written in your heart. The problem is, so often people are afraid to acknowledge what's in their heart for fear that somebody else will laugh at them. Also, people become so dull that they don't even know what's in their heart because their hope has been dashed so many times that they're afraid to dream again. And God wants to come by the Holy Spirit and awaken our hearts to dream again, to believe again, to have faith again, to realize that there's something in my heart that is written in the books of heaven. And if I can discover what's in my heart and acknowledge it, I might step into what's in my book in heaven. We need that awakened in us because we can never go into the courtroom and get things in place to get what's in our books if we first don't have an understanding somewhat of what's there about us. So whom he called, watch this, now he says he justified. What does that mean? That's courtroom. This is the court. Justified means to be declared innocent. This, this, is, this is a critical, if not the critical stage right here. Because once I get glimpses, and I begin to understand, that's, that's the exciting part. But now the devil is going to do against me and you just as he did against Peter. He's going to build a case and he is going to demand a trial. And he's going to dis- try to disqualify you from getting what's in your book. But when we know how to go into the courts of heaven and take the blood of Jesus and answer those accusations and order our life accordingly and aright, we will answer every every accusation and become justified or declared from the court of heaven innocent. Innocent. Let me tell you, the world may not say you're innocent, but when heaven says you're innocent, you're innocent. And there's nothing like being found innocent. There's nothing like knowing, sensing, and understanding that the blood of Jesus has answered every accusation, whether it's my sin or the sin of my bloodline or or motives or whatever it may be, that the blood of Jesus has answered every issue. And I have now been justified because of who he is and what he has done. But there is a contention in the heavenly courts Because he does not want you getting what's in your book. Why? Because he doesn't want you happy. He could care less whether you're happy or not. He don't care. The devil doesn't care. The reason he doesn't want you getting what's in your book 
is because if you do, the kingdom of God is going to advance. And if you get what's in yours and I get what's in mine and they get what's in theirs, then we're going to advance the kingdom on a huge level. In a huge way. And the devil doesn't want that. So the way he's going to stop that is to bring accusations against us and try to stop us and disqualify us from qualifying from what's in our book. That's exactly what he did for Peter. But Jesus said, I have prayed for you. And a verdict has been rendered in your behalf. And you have been found guiltless. Isn't that wonderful? The blood of Jesus causes us to be found guiltless. We'll go more into this tonight. But watch this. Once we've been to the court and been justified, then we enter a place I call convergence. Convergence. What does that mean? Well, the Bible says, whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. That doesn't mean going to heaven. That has nothing to do with going to heaven. Glorified simply implies you are now living out in some realm of fullness what has been written in the books of heaven about you. And one of the best pictures of this is Joseph. Joseph had a sense of what his call was. He had glimpses because of his dreams. His brothers sold him into slavery, threw him into a pit, sold him into slavery. He ended up in Potiphar's house. He was wrongly accused, ended up in prison. But we know the outcome of the story. He ends up as the prime minister of Egypt, literally sent ahead of time to be a preserver of life because that's what had been preordained in the counsels of God about him. Decisions were made that were written in the book. He was predestined. He got glimpses of it. He qualified in the courts. And literally everything converged together, the good, the bad, and everything in between until all that was in his life work together to literally bring him to this glorified position of fulfilling what was in his book. And he saved nations. He saved nations. You need to understand. Now watch this. When this happens, when you get things justified in the courts of heaven, you need to understand this, then everything will work together for your good. Everything will converge together. Everything will converge together for you to step into the place God has, has brought you. You may look at it and you may think, that can't happen. Look at, look at how things are in my life. I'm sure there were times that, that, that Joseph thought, how can I possibly, how will my mom and dad and my brothers ever bow down before me? I'm a prisoner, falsely accused. But let me tell you, when a verdict comes out of heaven and you're justified, everything works together for your good. Everything. So that you can step into this glorified state because everything converges together to fulfill the will of God in your life. I remember, I'll close with this. I remember in 2009, everything came against us everything I thought I was over I thought I hadn't done anything wrong honestly I had not but the the blasting the rumors the the, the uh, accusations all these things it just looked like everything was over I mean I, I thought my reputation was ruined they, they had they had done such a number on me because they weren't content just to have me leave they wanted me destroyed it was so demonic and I, we were thinking, why, what is going on here? I'm not telling you the whole story because it's, it's irrelevant. And I was in prayer one morning, and I heard the Lord. I heard the Lord. I heard the Lord. It was, I mean, so close to being audible. And he said these words to me. They do not determine your future. I do. They do not determine your future. I do. You see, I believe a verdict came out of heaven. I believe somehow, I didn't understand this then, that a verdict was rendered and God said, I have heard your cry and I release judgments into the matter. Not judgments against somebody or something, but judgments into the matter, decisions made that's going to allow over the process of time 
everything to converge together for you to step into your glorified position. Are you hearing this? And fulfill what was decided in the councils of heaven and written down in a book. But we have to know how to go into the courts of heaven and get that in place. So could you stand with me? Wow. Father, I just want to pray this.